Well, hello. That's me again, and uh, it's uh, Monday, uh, March 21st, and there are some things we can discuss, to, and we should really discuss today. And uh, for those people who uh, are history buffs, you don't have to be a really professional historian to do that and remember that. But recall 1945, and um, primarily uh, spring, and I mean early spring, March, April, and uh, recall what Hitler was hoping for in his um, really uh, attempts to save the Third Reich before he committed suicide and basically condemned Germany and, you know, because Germans who didn't support the Nazism, they should have been dead and held with them, you know, that was his attitude towards his own people. But the uh, point is that trying to avoid inevitable defeat and um, facing the, this steamrolling machine of the Red Army moving from the east, he was first hoping for this vengeance, you know, wunderwaffes, you know, miracle weapons, wonder weapons which can change, you know, or turn the tide of the war. Obviously it didn't work, both V1 and V2, so they they had very minor impact primarily on civilians. London got its share of those flying gizmos and gadgets, which later have been basically uh, imported, so to speak, by um, both Red Army and, of course, Americans. But, of course, when that didn't work out and it seemed not to do anything in terms of stopping the inevitable, you know, uh, assault of... Uh, uh, Red Army and uh, sur uh, the surrounding of the of Berlin. So the last moment, Hitler's uh, idea of saving the Ber saving Berlin and repulsing uh, Red Army was to call on the Wanks Twelfth um, Army, which was at that time fighting, so to speak, uh, in the West, facing the U.S. Army and basically allies, Western allies. And of course, uh, he was hoping for Wang's army to come in and, you know, do the miracle and save, defeat Zhukov's first Belarusian front. Well, front is army group. In. And um, that, of course, didn't happen. Wang went uh, with his whatever he had uh, on the, left from 12th army and uh, remnants of the 9th army. Maxim Hirich was the Potsdam, was Potsdam, then he was forced, basically beaten back, and eventually he just broke into the uh, uh, Western Allies territory and surrendered all his force to uh, uh, U.S. Army. We all know how the situation with Berlin ended up, but even till the last days of uh, Berlin and uh, Goebbels' propaganda was working just over time, and of course, Die Deutsche Wochenschau, anybody who ha has any clue, they know that Die Deutsche Wochenschau was showing how the Germans were still kind of killing, you know, those Russians and Americans and, you know, so, and it was all about that, yeah, just now we are ready now to repulse that damn Ruskies and just, you know, basically win war again and eventually end up in Moscow. Well, uh, it didn't happen this way, but yeah, Goebbels' propaganda worked uh, really, well, depends how you define it, but if efficiently till the last days. And the Deutsche Wachenschau was just one of those uh, instruments. Well, uh, if you think so that I'm talking about Ukraine and analogy to Ukraine, um, well, yes and no. Starting about uh, starting uh, with Ukraine, uh, obviously uh, the analogy with Hitler in 1945 if it's very apt. It's really fully applies here. Make no mistake. But I'm talking about even larger issue. I'm talking about what is happening right now in the Western capitals, and that's exactly what is happening in the Western capitals because what they face now is a defeat of unimaginable proportions. I was, before going to Ukraine, I will start with the simple fact, and I, make no mistake, I am no energy specialist. I have no background in energy, in its uh, extraction, processing, I'm talking especially hydrocarbons like oil, gas, so, 
I rely in this case on or defer to the professionals and common sense obviously, but I prefer when I write about it like I did in the last in my last book, I defer constantly and make reference constantly to people who are orders of magnitude better than me prepared to speak about this. So and uh, when I went today for to the oil price and uh, this website, which I periodically refer, refer to, and not because it's that good, but because it gives the numbers. It's much easier to uh, get into the news aggregator, the numbers on the uh, uh, basically oil. And what you see is the fact that today Brent uh, crude is uh, selling for $115.8 and it r rose uh, more than 7%. And... Um, it's just the start and what need, needs to be understood. When I was writing my last book and I described there again, referring and deferring to professionals, I used uh, the name of Alexander Novak very often there. I usually prefer to write my books for the American or Western audience use, uh, using primarily Western sources, but because the uh, 2020 oil war between the West and Russia uh, was about Russia and was about American shale oil and things of this nature, uh, Alexander Novak was popping here and there when he was uh, speaking on the issue of the uh, oil, or crude, if you wish. Well, he is very uncolorful man. He is pretty much reserved and pretty straightforward looking. He, you, you would have missed him for some office manager in United States somewhere. But the guy has this incredible propensity, because he is Russia's uh, energy minister, to be very precise in his forecasts. I don't remember him missing anything in terms of predicting and this not coming true. Well, he's professional. He knows what he's talking about. And speaking today to uh, media, uh, commenting on the fact that the United States wants to now shut down completely any kind of uh, oil operations with Russia, he said, hey, uh, if the West wants to, you know, stop importing Russia's oil, hey, God bless. But he was correct when he stated that, yeah, well, you will get $300 a barrel price. And I can tell you this, it's, uh, I cannot basically uh, estimate or assess what is happening in the West and combined West and in the United States, which leads the West charge against Russia and now pretty much against the Eurasian uh, economic uh, union, which is a common market, which is forming, is they really decided to commit suicide. Because obviously for Russians, it doesn't matter. I mean, Russia sells its oil to China. She sells its oil to India. And actually, the oil export to China will only grow. It already continues to grow. And Russian prices on gas, I mean, you know, it's kind of... They're fairly stable. They grow a little bit here and there. But generally speaking, it's not too bad. But what will West do if it has uh, $300 a barrel uh, price of crude? In fact, Novak says that at some, in some point it may grow to $500 a bar barrel. Well, I can tell you what's going to happen. The economy will collapse really fast and it will bring about the freaking revolution. And I am sitting here, just scratch my head and uh, asking myself the question, what are they thinking about? I mean, Russians, as I already stated, they are pretty insulated from that. And uh, I am on the record, pretty much any uh, report or any forecast regarding Russia's economic realities for the last 20 years from any kind of uh, organizations, be it the Heritage uh, Foundation, be it CIA or whatever, it never comes to comes true. I mean, it, they just don't understand how Russia works, how Russian economy operates, and that is why they uh, being completely mis, uh, uh, misinformed and being in, uh, residing in some kind of the, the delusion, economic delusion, which is really expected from the uh, monetarism, which uh, dominates the uh, Western uh, economic thinking, they literally make decisions based on fantasy. 
it's absolutely it's just suicidal obviously but um you have to ask the question how competent they are not only just professionally we know they are not very good professionally be it military western military or be it economic people and uh, but mentally because why do you want to create a economic hardship which already makes great depression look funny compared to it because it's coming it's actually partially it's already there well you know, your guess is as good as mine, because I'm not into this, uh, basically, they used to have the Kremlinology term, you know, in the Soviet times, Kremlinology being the uh, ability to judging and observing the moves, cadre moves in Politburo or Central Committee in Moscow to make some kind of predictions based on what they were uh, 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 observing in uh, changes in Soviet policies and things of this nature. Nowadays, uh, if there's a criminal, the white houseology, if you want to, or what have you, I mean, if you would be involved in that kind of assessments and uh, observations, you you will have cognitive dissonances all the time. You will have to ask the question, indeed, are those people normal? Do they understand what they are doing? Their conclusion, obviously, is that they don't. And that's why it brings us to back to my uh, initial analogy with, the, with Hitler and uh, he, in his bunker in 1945. And wonder, 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 wonder Waffles, you know, those wonder weapons, and of course the Wenk's uh, 12th Army, which was supposed to save Berlin. This is exactly the same on the global level for the West currently and again we uh, probably will talk more about it because uh, at this stage it's just like you know what uh, there is something there go, go, there's something going on there which even beyond our grasp for now and this is probably not just administrative or bureaucratic or any kind of state uh, statesmanship thing it's probably mental and yes, it's not a secret that West is disintegrating. There is no secret that West is declining and the emergence of this monstrous Eurasian military and economic superpower, uh, which is, you know, you have to really start thinking about. But the same on the much lower level also relates to Ukraine because uh, basically it's just reflection of the West in terms of what is going on there militarily and as I already stated I am a little bit tired now to constantly debunking all this I mean psychobabble by all kinds of the humanities educated uh, politologists in the United States writing about war in uh, Ukraine and uh, many US generals who evidently don't understand what they're talking about and they talk uh, and spew BS primarily for the propaganda purposes and to alleviate their butthurt because obviously US Army never encountered anything like this in the modern history and again uh, uh, those sons and daughters of the first Gulf War just give it a rest I mean it's, you just cannot compare this and uh, the point is that uh, out of the clear uh, fact of basically Mariupol uh, siege or if you want the clearing being reduced now only to the Azov style uh, area where the last remnants of the uh, Azov uh, uh, Nazi battalion and um, remnants of VSU uh, are basically beaten into the ground and are hiding primarily in the, uh, those massive concrete uh, uh, reinforced uh, uh, um, um, enforcements of you with fortresses which they created for the last eight years so that's pretty much it and there is another thing which is of course um, worth noting it is extensive use by Russia of the hypersonic weapons namely Kinjal it's not just one use there are several strikes by Kinjal already and um, I know for a fact now from what I observe and what I read that it produced a shocking impression in the West, in NATO. And that use of the hypersonic weapons will continue and uh, you also probably could see today rather dramatic uh, 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 video or you know whatever the, the documentary which have been posted by Russian Defense Ministry it is of the annihilation of the number of the uh, storage of the uh, 
some ammunition, especially for the multiple launch rocket systems, which were also parked there in one of the abandoned hotels in Kiev. And it is, uh, I think so, it was hit by Iskander. But in general, for people who still think that, uh, and they continue to spread this gospel of Russians being on the verge of defeat and, uh, you know, just about being demoralized and they based everything on what they say here in the Western Ukrainian propaganda. And even Le Figaro today, which obviously hates Russian gods, it had to admit that basically Yuki spread BS and propaganda when they were talking about this famous Vasily Bykov uh, patrol ship, which was allegedly sunk. Obviously, this whole uh, propaganda shtick with the uh, Snake Island and Vasily Bykov sunk, and I already addressed it in my previous videos. It is just a testimony of the ridiculous idiocy, a level of idiocy, which uh, basically being propagated by the um, media in the West and a lot of it uh, political elites, most of them who have no clue about real war and their experts who also suggest to them, you know, and advise them on the issues of war and warfare in Russia, they also don't have a clue. And uh, when Biden is, uh, and Sen uh, U.S. Congress actually uh, is about to uh, vote, I'm not sure they probably already voted on this package of help to Ukraine, even some people like um, in Congress, Congresswoman, uh, um, was uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she already kind of asked the question if the, uh, this uh, aid to Ukraine uh, will end up, at least part of it, in uh, neo-Nazi hand. Good question. Does the United States support Nazi regime in Kiev? Oh, absolutely. Is it Nazi regime? Oh, yes, it is. But, yeah, at least some some congresswoman uh, had enough, you know, balls of steel to, come, you know, start questioning this whole situation. But in the same time, we, ha we shouldn't forget that in the United States, where the politics is made primarily for the sake of re-election and bipartisan bickering, and it is all for the show of for public, even that uh, uh, inquiry and this uh, very legit legitimate question may uh, pursue completely different uh, uh, objectives than merely, you know, putting the United States, uh, you know, on the right course in terms of the, its relation with the basically Nazi regime it helped to create. It probably is some kind of ploy against uh, Republicans against Democrats and maybe Trump, you know, who knows, because it's United States nowadays and politically it's a complete mess. And that also goes back to my initial introduction of, of the this uh, uh, Hitler dreams and uh, hopes that somehow some, some magical weapon or uh, some, uh, you know, 12th Army of Wang can uh, save him and save Berlin. Obviously, it's not happening. And that uh, basically uh, applies completely to, to the modern West. And um, what I see now is the trend, uh, economic trend, that uh, West only now begins to kind of grasp what is coming for it because of Russian sanctions. And the bottom line of this is the dollarization. It is a strategic catastrophe of unimaginable scale because everything United States today represents out of self of its remaining power, of its remaining wealth. There is still some power, there is still some wealth. Do not, uh, you know, uh, misinterpret me that I'm saying, oh, United States is going to collapse. Europe is going to collapse, but United States may still endure a little bit longer. Well, precisely because Europe will collapse. But the point is that uh, remove dollar and what's left. And I used uh, this uh, phrase, and I'm using it right now. I was using it while writing things, now I'm verbalizing it. The cutting to size of the American economy and American, uh, uh, basically, power and uh, uh, position, a statue, is happening right now. The United States still will remain the major power, but it's certainly not a hegemon it was trying to present itself for the last 30 years. It never was really. The only thing the United States had at that time was the ability to 
establish uh, certain institutions which were granted to the United States by default at some point of time by Bretton Woods and uh, allowed it to, you know, uh, be the main cashier, so to speak, of the world until the United States stopped being the main cashier of the world, first by getting off the gold standard and nowadays just basically uh, forbidding people don't, or countries they don't like to use dollar. Well, guess what? Reputations are really hard to build up. They are very easy to lose and it happens usually in an instance. And that's what we observe right now. And you should also understand that, yeah, obviously such major players as, as uh, uh, China or India or larger countries of the uh, Pakistan and, you know, just name it, Turkey even. Uh, they obviously see it. They obviously make their own conclusions. And they obviously ask the question if, are we next? And that's the thing which uh, American policymakers uh, do not understand. But again, I'm on record about the intellectual level. So, and that's what is happening right now. And uh, this was uh, my attempt to give you some impression on the major, major tectonic shifts really in geopolitics and in our emerging really brave new world, multipolar one. And um, we have to kind of follow its, you know, uh, emergence or evolution and stay put and stay observant. And that's what I wanted uh, to suggest to you today. And as always, I want to remind you to subscribe and those who can uh, afford to support me on Patreon. Plus, I want to make an announcement. I will be uh, putting up again people who support me on Patreon uh, later, but for people who really write to me, I I'm bombarded by messages and emails and things like that. People remember I'm only one human being and uh, I can do only so much and I can respond to only so many things simultaneously. Obviously, I uh, give the preference to people whom I know and to uh, media organizations which ask uh, about my interviews. So be patient. If I do not respond immediately, or that means I could have forgotten or I simply don't have time, I may respond later. So. Please don't get offended or you know by this because there's no malice intended here whatsoever. So just keep in mind I'm a very busy busy bee here, you know. So but that's what I wanted to talk to you about today and uh this is sort of primer for the Monday guys and I'll talk to you later. Stay put, stay healthy, talk to you later. Bye bye.